Well, good Wednesday morning, friends and family. As another day passes by, another thought for you. We're going to throw back to 2014 with a lesson entitled, Are You Trying to Make the Trip on an Empty Tank? Hope you have a great Wednesday, and we'll have another lesson posted this evening for your uh, study and such. Also remember, we at the South Jackson Congregation are going to assemble again together at our building on Sunday, May the 10th, which is Mother's Day. We do ask that everyone that would like to come, we will be practicing social distancing and all the guide, following the guidelines of the CDC in order to make this assembly possible. We appreciate all of you and all the comments that you've made through the past several weeks and hope you have a blessed day. Tonight we want to look at a topic which really, if I think back years ago, would be every college student's nightmare. And that is to look down over at that little gauge. And most college students' cars stay like this all the time, close to the empty mark. So our challenge tonight is, and the question we want to ask is, are you trying to make the trip on an empty tank? In our very midst, we have the master of the empty gas gauge. I get in the car Tuesday with her, and we're going to go to, uh, or excuse me, a week ago last Thursday, she's going to take me for my MRI. She gets in the car, and it is below the E. And I said, are you sure that we're going to make it to our destination? And she says, yes. I have done this many, many times. What she was really saying is, we're stopping at Walmart and you're going to fill my car up. Which I did. But I remember back when I was in college, I did the same thing. As a matter of fact, I knew exactly how much gas it took to get from Henderson, Tennessee to Elizabethtown, Kentucky. I knew exactly how many miles I could drive on a tank of gas. And mind you, this was long before a car came equipped with the computer that said you have X number of miles to empty. Or even before they came and had that little light that comes on and that tells you you've got 40 or 50 miles left, okay? I knew exactly what it took to get from point A to point B. I decided that I was going to go to point C before I went to point B. Because I was going to go home and I was going to make a little money that weekend and I was going to work. And so I needed to go by and see the gentleman I worked for during the summer and during breaks and get the keys. I get two miles from my house. And guess what? I had to make that long walk to someone's house and call and say, Dad, can you come get me? Can you bring me a gallon of gas? Yes, he brought me a gallon of gas. But the lecture I received when I got home, I've never run out of gas since that day. And I'm going to knock on wood. Because as sure as I say I've never done it, I'm going to do it this week. But brethren, all of us, or some of us, may be planning to take a trip this week, or maybe next week. And you're going to make sure you have all that you need. The wise person is going to fill up with gasoline, right? Why is it, brethren, we can understand the principle that we need to fill that gas tank up before we make that long journey? Yet there are so many folks, and the attitude of so many today is to try to get by with as little as they can when it comes to doing their job or when it comes to doing their schoolwork or even when it comes, sadly, to the work that they need to do in the body of Christ, the church. I believe Jesus teaches us the lesson of the second mind. And so if you turn to Matthew chapter 5 and you begin reading in verse 38, Notice what the words of Jesus as he is delivering the Sermon on the Mount is. 
His words are these. He says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And then verse 41 is the key verse. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Truly Jesus teaches us in that passage to go above and beyond what is required. And so I believe from looking at some perspective from that passage that you and I need to do more than is expected, which is more than the minimum. Notice with me a few things about going more than the minimum. First of all, as we've already stated, Jesus taught us to do more than the minimum. We read it in Matthew 5 and verse 41 where he says, If someone compels you to go one mile, go with him too. What about the, wise, the virgins that we talked about this morning? The wise virgins in Matthew 25. Did they not go above and beyond what was expected of them? And as you think about those wise virgins, we know that they took their lamps, they took plenty of oil, if the bridegroom were to come early, they would have been over-prepared. But if he came late, they would have been exactly ready for that situation too. When I think of going to Second Mile, I think going to Second Mile brings to us a sense of accomplishment. It brings within our life and within our heart that sense of joy knowing that we have done more than was asked. And so as I think about that particular thing, I understand the first mile is required. The second mile can be better described as that which is done out of love. It is that which expresses the love that we have. You see, when you think about going the second mile, an example would be in a marriage. At what point in our marriage should we go the second mile? Should we not go the second mile with our spouse all the time? How about with our children in the home? Do we not want to go the second mile with our children? Or even while we are at work? Those who go the second mile are those who succeed and are those who move up in the corporate ranks. Those who just try to skirt by, they never progress very far. And so, as I say, we understand this principle of doing more than the minimum as it relates to the physical life. But as with many other lessons, why is it we can't translate that and transfer that over in our relationship to God. You see, I, I struggle with that. And so as I think and as I look at Jesus teaches about doing more than the minimum, I secondly understand that we receive more than the minimum. When Jesus came, did he not give us more than the minimum? When you think about God, you and I ought to be thankful to God that he did not try to see how little that he could do for us. If you turn to Ephesians chapter 2 and you look at verse 8 and verse 9, the Apostle Paul says, For by grace are you saved through faith. Notice what else he says. He said it is the gift of God, not by works. Why? Lest any man should boast. <coughs> You see, God gave us the greatest gift ever known to man. And that is so that we can have grace in his eyes through his son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> or how about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Did he go the second mile? Think about him and his life and his teachings 
he teaches us about going that second mile. If you turn to John chapter 10 and you look at verse 10, you remember that he says that he came that he might give life, but not just life, but he came to give it what? Most all of you know it says he came to give us life more abundantly. Brethren, that's the second mile. The second mile is Jesus saying, I want you to have that abundant life. But how about we now go back to God? And if you turn to 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and verse 2, not only are we slaves, but God also says through John that we become His sons. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. God wants us to serve Him, but He also wants us to be His child. And He has made every effort and put forth all of that extra mile to make sure that we can be His children. Or when it relates to His blessings that He bestows upon us. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 3, look at verse 20. Notice what he says, and this is a, a wonderful verse to keep in mind. Now to Him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power, his power that works within us. Do you see what Paul is trying to tell us about how God blesses us? He blesses us in ways that we will never be able to understand. In ways that our feeble human comprehension will not be able to understand. Does God bless us every day? Does He not? If you think He doesn't bless you every day, He put the very first blessings in motion back in the book of Genesis as He brought all things into existence through creation. Every day when you wake up, and you're able to draw that first breath of air, God has blessed you. Every day when you sit down and you're able to partake of the provisions, the food that He has provided, God has blessed you. Those are things we understand. Do we really understand in other ways in which God blesses us? Are we able to understand and comprehend those? It just really is amazing to me that before the foundation of the world that God had put a plan in motion to save my soul. Now think about that blessing. Before the world was ever created, before the world was ever spoken into existence, God had a plan by which I would be able to live with Him in eternity. I can't comprehend. I know He did it. And I know that He loved me. But can I really understand why He did it? You know, I sit back in my mind and I think, okay, God, when you created the world, you knew before you ever created man, you knew he was going to fall and he was going to sin. <coughs> Why did you even create us? You knew that it was going to cost you your only begotten son, his life on the cross. Why did you create us? Stop and ponder on that for a while. I can't comprehend all of those things. I'm glad He created us. I'm glad He had a plan. I'm glad He sent His Son so that I could have a hope to live with Him in eternity. You see, you and I receive way more than the minimum. 
So coming to our last point tonight, you and I need to live each day with the idea to do more than the minimum. Would you agree with me that we should aim to be better than average? Let me ask you a couple of questions. Can anyone tell me what happened to the average person in Noah's day? Do you know what happened to them? They drowned. <laughs> or how about the average person who left Egypt? What happened to them? They died in the wilderness. What happens to the average person? They're going to be lost. That's the lesson I see from those two statements. How would you have liked to have been an average person in Sodom and Gomorrah? What happened to them? Did they not perish during the fire and brimstone that rained down from heaven above? You see, the average person perished. And so that's why I say that you and I need to do more than the minimum. We need to live with that thought in our mind all the time. That idea, the concept. You see, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and verse 15, that it does take more than the minimum to be saved. Notice what he says. He says, for the love of Christ constrains us, because th we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Do you remember last Sunday as we were talking about our budget? And we spoke of the Macedonians in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Do you remember what they did first and foremost in their life? They first gave themselves. For us to be saved, it takes more than just the minimum. It takes more than us just stating that we believe. More than the minimum is showing we believe through the life we live. That's why Paul in Romans chapter 12 verse 1 and verse 2 tells us not to be conformed to the world, but to be transformed. Don't be like the average person, but be changed into one who goes above and beyond. And then this last thing, it takes more than the minimum to be a true disciple. <coughs> And I hope you know what Luke chapter 14, verse 26 and verse 27 says. Where it says there, Jesus speaking, he says, If any man comes to me and hates not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, even his own life also. Notice what he says. He says, He cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and comes after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus, what are you telling me? In order for me to be what Jesus wants me to be, a true disciple, I've got to put everything behind me and make him my priority. Brethren, that's more than the minimum. Are you trying to make the, the trip on an empty tank? We have many, and this sermon may have been better preached on Sunday morning when some more folks need to, that they needed to hear it were here. But are we trying to make that trip on an empty tank? You see, you and I have received more than the minimum from the Lord. Therefore, we must be willing to give more than the minimum back to Him. So tonight, the question is very simple. Are you willing to go the second mile? Are you willing to give your all? And then some. And then some. Will you give everything you got? Plus a little more? Tonight, if you're not a member of the body of Christ, you can begin that journey of going the extra mile.
by putting Christ on in baptism with a penitent heart, a willingness to repent, confess Jesus as the Son of the living God, and you can be immersed in the watery grave of baptism where your sins will be washed away. Or if you've done that and you've just been trying to skirt by, you've been like some of us that have tried to make that trip on just enough gas to get there, because maybe we're too tight, maybe we're too cheap to fill the car up with gas. Maybe we don't want to spend what we have. If I put all my money in the gas tank, I won't have enough to go get me a cheeseburger. You know, we reason all kinds of ways as to why we don't do certain things. But brethren, when it comes to the work of the church in your life to Christ, you need to be all in. And then some. Tonight, what's your need? Only you know. We ask if you have a need that you come and make it.